This part always takes a little bit of a minute. That's fine, no worries. I'm, I'm not in any <laughs> And Make sure they're eating regular food, not that. Okay, everybody, welcome to Politics and Prosecco. We are joined by City Councilor at Large, Anissa Asaibi George. And um, before we do that, first we want to welcome you, of course. But the first thing we want to know is what are you sipping on tonight? Well, it's Prosecco and Politics. Okay. Politics and Prosecco. Um, so I'm I've got a bottle of Prosecco, just a mini bottle. I love a good La Marca. Um, That's my brand. I love, I love a good La Marca. Listen, it's beautiful. And we do the mini bottle, avoid any problems when we get the full bottle. Well, listen, I mean, hey, we're just going to do our own thing here. I love it. What, what is your um, drink of the evening? So I am doing a vodka and blueberry spritzer in a mason jar because I feel like that's how you're supposed to drink. A yep. vodka spritzer with blueberry. I'd say. Um, and so spring is almost here. So I like that. And I'll be honest, this is my second. So <laughs> I'm fine with that. Um, but I want to make sure that we are actually going live on um, our politics and Prosecco page as well, because right. um, we are doing this from my personal page. So everybody just bear with us and we're gonna lock in in like five minutes. Okay, so let me just share this to the page. All right, so before, so let's get started. Tell us exactly why you are running for mayor right now. Well, first, thank you very much for having me on this evening. I think it's a lot of fun and I love the idea of having a little bit of fun while talking about serious issues. When I was elected to the Boston City Council in 2016, I painted my office hot pink. Um, it's my campaign color, it's the color of my business, it's a fantastic color, it screams a lot of things, um, including uh, women power, femininity, I, I think it's, it's a wonderful color, it's strong, it's bold, things I like to say about myself. And I got some criticism. People are like, oh, I mean, oh, that's so silly. It's a city councilor's office. You're doing real work in here and you've got paint walls. I go, listen, it's paint. It's not policy. It's paint, right? Like it's just a coat of paint, right? It's, I don't even know what a can of Benjamin Moore costs today. But you know, I love the idea that we're mixing a little bit of fun hence the Prosecco. That's right. Or the blueberry vodka spritza. Tonight's a vodka. With with um, serious talk about policy and work. And you know, for me, I love this city. Um, I love the work that I get to do as a city councilor. I love the impact that my experience as a small business owner and as a classroom teacher has had on that work. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to apply that to the corner office. I want to apply that to um, leading the city as, as mayor of Boston. So we have a little fun, I think, tonight talking about both um, sort of the lightness of this city, but some of the really, I think, serious issues that we're facing as a city and the, the real work that needs to be done um, and that I look forward to doing as mayor. Okay, so let's talk about how you got here. So talk to us about your record because see, what I think people don't understand is in a pandemic, hmm. it's hard to go out and do house parties. It's hard to go out and do some glad handing. Um, and so because of that, if people don't know who you are, if they haven't been paying attention or they just aren't, you know, into city hall go government, um, and they don't know who you are, you're going to have to run on record. Mm -hmm. And I've said every, on every show, there are definitely some people who are running on a very slim record. 
And so why don't you talk to the audience about your record and why that qualifies you to not only just run for office, but to be an elected official? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I appreciate it very much. I'm running both on my record as an at-large city council and the work I've been able to do over the last uh, just over five years, as well as my experience in the classroom, spending 13 years as a high school teacher in Boston at East Boston High School, and then also the years um, I've spent building my business, running my business, and I'm having a successful business here in the city of Boston, which especially during this time isn't, um, is, is difficult work, is hard work and empathize and, and feel for so many of the small businesses across our city. I will just say very quickly. Those are her boys. So. That, well, it is um, different four-legged boys. Oh, I've got okay. a COVID puppy. So uh, like many families um, during this period of time, we um, as a family decided to get a puppy. We've got Astro and his cousin COVID puppy has come over for a visit. Oh. I don't think they realized we were doing anything tonight. They don't anyway, care. <laughs> they don't care. Similar yeah. to my four boys who I love dearly, those that are walking two legs, I um, um, who often are the ones causing the ruckus, they also don't care. I think it's it's sort of funny. Someone actually asked me today, what do the boys think about you running for mayor? And I'm like, yeah, they're sort of indifferent. They've been they've been here before at the city council race and yeah. you know, they know that there'll be some things that, that they have to do. But other than that, it's yeah. just, you know, full steam ahead in all of their activities. But anyway, so, you know, my record on the city council is one that I'm, I'm very proud of. You know, I am a former classroom teacher, so I do a lot of work in our education space and I'm chairing the council's committee on education, I'm proud of the work that we've done both sort of with broader brush strokes when we think about reopening BPS, when we think about the uh, build BPS plan, when we think about uh, academic achievement, very broad, broad brush strokes. I'm mm -hmm. proud of that work and, and the focus of that work. But also because I'm a classroom, was a classroom teacher, because I'm a BPS parent, because I'm a BPS graduate, I know the system in a very different way. I'm, I, I'm able to be very intimate in sort of the inner workings of our school department and what's happening in our school communities. So I've been able to get into the weeds around special education um, and, and the significant needs of improvement around uh, the way that our special education department functions and or, or doesn't function sometimes really for the benefit of our kids. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to really explore and look at how we're spending our transportation budget. I'm uh, on um, the yellow buses that you know travel our city. I'm able to get into the weeds when it comes to what's missing at Madison Park Vocational Technical School. And because of those experiences, because of that work, I've been able to work in partnership with colleagues, with, with Mayor Walsh, with others to push a certain agenda to make sure that not all of our kids have access to a high quality school, but that all of our schools are high quality. Are so wait, can I just jump in? Because I also want to remind the audience that Madison Park is one of just two vocational schools in Massachusetts, right? There's no. like, is it more than two? Oh yeah, there's, there's, more more than than there's many vocational schools in okay. uh, Massachusetts. Madison happens to be one of the schools that in the whole Commonwealth in the state that has um, significant capacity and ability to add kids, okay. to welcome more students. Um, and, you know, and that goes hand in hand with really strengthening and developing new programs at Madison, making sure that there is a, an appropriate application process that kids um, who are in, at Madison are able to um, have access to a comprehensive vocational, technical, and academic program, that there's also very direct connections to uh, the workforce, to yeah. future uh, schooling and other academic opportunities, and, you know, really find a lifetime of success. Through that work on Madison, I've visited with many voc tech schools across the Commonwealth, um, as well as meeting with several times, all of the executive directors and leaders of all of those other schools and to really understand where the opportunity is for Madison to go. I'm a graduate of Boston Tech. It's now the O'Brien. When I attended Boston as Tech- As am I, and Miss Allison that? shout us out on uh, Facebook. So um, we're very I proud love it. Of I love it. Yeah, the Tech Tiger all the way, baby. Um, but that, you know, that educational experience really opened my eyes to so many opportunities. Um, I took sheet metal and drafting and architecture and computer science and electronics. And, you know, although I was very much on um, a course to go to college, having exposure to those other fields and to have exposure to um, those opportunities really opened my eyes to um, the, my, my own potential. 
And, and for a moment in time, I thought about going to, you know, architecture school and ended up marrying an engineer. And when my husband and I started dating, he's like, what do you mean you can read floor plans? What do you mean? You know what, you know, what this means? And I go, Sorry, because what? I took, you know, <laughs> Because I did this in high school. I had this, I had this great exposure, this great opportunity in high school. And when I think about the work at Madison Park, it should be the gem of our school system here in Boston. And, and, and we have not focused the resources on it. And over the course of this campaign, um, oh, over the course of my work on the city council, it has been a focal point of mine. It's been central to my work on the council to really push Madison along. We've made some incremental, some baby steps in that work. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, over the course of my run for mayor and, and, and one campaign promise I've made, I've made two campaign promises over the, the course of this last six weeks. Uh, one is that we need to figure out a way um, to reopen Boston for business. We are getting there. Things are certainly improving, but so many of our businesses have suffered our, our economy as a whole, but then our smaller economies across all of our neighborhoods have, uh, many of them have been devastated. The second so promise is that we do um, something very different in my first 100 days in, in office as mayor around Madison Park and taking that full weight of the mayor's office and, and of that position of power and really shifting how we're thinking and approaching the work at Madison Park. Yeah. And, and maybe BPS as a whole, right? Like it's focusing on as BPS whole. as a yeah. whole. So listen, we, of course, we, we hear what the streets are saying. And so we, we have some additional questions to ask. My first question is going to be, with all you just said about where the city is and where the city is going, why decide to run for mayor now? Why not challenge before? No, no, it's a great question. It's one I've gotten a number of times over the last six weeks or four weeks since I've announced that I was running for mayor. I've been able to, over the last four years, five years, uh, work in a really close partnership with Mayor Walsh on, on some of my own initiatives and on my agenda. And, and that partnership was really important to me. That partnership in many ways was critical both to my own success and the work uh -huh. that I was looking at on the council, but also because of my relationship with Mayor Walsh, which has been a longstanding relationship, sure. I was able to push him on a lot of things. And we got to a place where we now have a special commission in place that will work to end family homelessness here in the city of Boston. We work together on some Look, of the- I'm There we go, I love it, I love it, my kind of girl. We work um, over this time to make sure that we were able to increase investments and in mental health clinicians to work with our residents who are experiencing a mental health crisis and really shifting the approach of um, how we respond to a, a resident that's having a mental health crisis. We don't need a police response always. Sometimes we need that co-response model, but an individual in crisis needs, um, needs support, um, not police. So we've been able to do a lot of um, this work in partnership, uh, both on my own personal agenda and finding ways to um, encourage and um, work with Mayor Walsh. Okay, so I just want to be clear. Um, so you, 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 it's hard to challenge your friend. Um, it's hard to challenge somebody you respect. Um, Massachusetts is not known for a lot of challenging incumbents. So at least, at least you can say this was my friend, and we were working together, and so that's why I didn't yeah. challenge. I get that. Yeah. I mean, and also though, from a strategic perspective, th those two things are, are true. We have a longstanding friendship and relationship. Um, we happen to grow up on the same street together. Our mothers are still there. We've been able to work together and have a very productive working relationship. And I do have a great deal of respect for Mayor Walsh. I look forward to being mayor of this city and, and continuing that partnership as he becomes labor secretary and, and really developing very strong bonds between his work in DC yeah. and what we need to do here in the city of Boston. But I'd also say as a Dorchester girl, there are some very specific strategic decisions that need to get to be made. I can run for all the offices I, I want, sure. but if there isn't a plan in place, if there isn't a particular strategy that will find me some success, I lose my seat. I'm not running for re-election. I've done a really good job as mm -hmm. an at-large city council representing all of the residents across the city of Boston. I'm giving that up because I want to be mayor and, and the work that I've been able to do there has prepared me for that role. And I look forward to being successful and leading this city through a challenging time um, into a period of sustained recovery. And, and let's really see 
all that Boston can be on the other end because we as a city have not reached our full potential. Right, so I'm, I'm glad you said that because, so two things I wanna hit on um, in that. Um, I think you're right. I think there is something to be said that you can always improve your city. Um, and having grown up here, having, I always say coming of age in this city, um, and that means living, working, and playing in this city, um, that's important to Boston residents that they, that someone is going to be up there who understands the culture of this city and didn't adopt this city and then has decided that, well, it's some places are bad and some places are good, but I'm only going to hang out in the good places. Um, and so part of that is a lot of people are going to be looking at the Boston bread candidates for something different, um, as opposed to people who may not have grown up here or may not have come of age in this city. Um, okay, so I want to say that. And then secondly, so you mentioned you were a girl from Dorchester. Some of the things that have been said about you, Anissa, is where, what, how do you identify? And, and the reason why is because as a woman of color, I often take, um, I take it personal when people say I'm a person of color, but they don't adopt the culture. They don't adopt the, the, the anger. They don't adopt the brutality sometimes as a person of color. And people tend to be a person of color when it's convenient, whenever they're in front of what audience. And during this last Senate campaign, one of the things that I had talked to Joe Kennedy about was people of color are not a monolith. And there are definitely ethnicities that have different values and they have different um, pain and we wanna address that. So our first question is, because if you wanna put the, the, the rumors to rest, now, if P and people are questioning sure. how you identify, do that so now, but also yeah. tell us, because it's Black History Month, as you know, I'm mm -hmm. Randy's raps, even though my mother just like texted me earlier and was like, enough with the raps. Love <laughs> She's like, just go to the hair salon. <laughs> so, um, so one, how do you identify? Um, and I and I understand that that's a a brutal question to ask. It's, it it's is not no, but it's unfair in a way of if I'm a person of color, I shouldn't be challenged on this. And I had this conversation with a friend of mine recently. I can rock a wrap and a, a necklace from you know, a Harlem market, and nobody is going to question my authenticity. Because I show up in the world as a Black woman every mm -hmm. day, all day. Yep. Um, and I'm unapologetic about it. So where do you stand unapologetically about who you are, how you identify, and how you show up in the world? Because I'm going to tell you, Black people looking at this race are going to be like, do I pick a Black candidate? Which is what a lot of people are thinking. Or do I stand with the candidate that's going to to take my values to the table. Mm -hmm. So where you stand, girl? Yeah, no, so that's a, it, that's a, um, it's a loaded question for sure. It's, it, but it's an important one. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it is, it's so fun talking about this. It, it is, cause it's complicated. Race, ethnicity, identity, it's complicated, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, as an Arab, um, sometimes I count quite honestly, sometimes I count as a person of color, sometimes I don't. And, you know, if, you know, we're talking with our Prosecco, and we're, you know, we're getting to know each other. Mm -hmm. I think it's really, you know, so for me, it's, um, it's a difficult place in which I've existed. And mm -hmm. I would say first, I sometimes in, in, in historically, or, you know, uh, let me back up a little bit. So I often get asked the question, not how do you identify? The question is usually posed, where are you from? Mm. And I go, and I know what the question is, right? Yes, go, of course. So my answer is Dorchester. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's not what they mean. Because yeah. they see, and, and my privilege is certainly people see a reflection of what they want to see, right? I'm working okay. in Boston, right. am I Italian, am I Latina? Am I, you know, who am I, what am I? And I'm very proud and unapologetic to be an Arab. And I'm very proud of my heritage. My mother is Polish. I'm very proud of that heritage. I'm very proud of, the experiences, difficult experiences both my parents went through to get to this place and proud they made those sacrifices so mm -hmm. that I can live out, you know, my American dream. Um, and I think oftentimes being an Arab, again, you, sometimes you count, sometimes you don't count. And for me, it is something I have all of my life 
left up to the observer. Because mm-hmm. you know what? I'm here to do the work, right? And I want- But in doing the work, it, it means being able to identify and be right. relatable to the, as, as, as Ayana says, the people closest to the pain, right. to the closest to the power. Right. Like th- that, I, t- I kind of twist that a little bit and say, okay, I want you to feel my pain, but I also want you to give me some power. Right, right. And so, you know, my, my work, what I do on the council is certainly uh, through my lens, through my experience, growing up in a very white part of Dorchester as an Arab, as the daughter of a Muslim, Mm-hmm. Um, in a community that I didn't look like, but recognize that I had a certain privilege that I could sort of go here and I can go there. Okay. Um, my, my problem has always been no matter which room I'm in. And again, I have access to all of the rooms. Sure. Right. Sure. Yep. Yep. There's never a seat at the table for me. And that mm-hmm. is, that's my own pain. I deal with it again. It's fine. It is what it is. So I lead and govern and legislate and create policy. Um, with my own lens, my own experience. What is so important for a leader to do, because a leader can only, any one woman can only lead based on her own experiences. Yeah. What a leader needs to do is surround themselves with others who have had those other experiences to inform the work. I will never live your life. I will never be a black woman. And Appreciate it's it. important okay. yep. to be informed by black women on oh, somebody. What, yeah, right. On what your experience is, you yeah. teach me and inform the work. And so my greatest skill set, I was a pretty good teacher, pretty good businesswoman. I'm a half okay mother most days. Um, but my <laughs> greatest skill is making sure that those that are around the table are reflective of, they have the racial, um, there's the, you know, we, we meet racial diversity numbers, that we meet ethnicity diversity numbers, that we meet gender diversity. Because I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to take a sip on this. And I'm going to tell you, diversity to me means means something totally different to a lot of people. I don't include women in diversity because white women can walk into any sector with a bachelor's degree, two years of experience and get like a a C-suite job. I got to come in there with four degrees, two ex-husbands, five kids, 15 years of experience, four recommendations. One has to be from Michelle Obama in order for me to just get an interview. So I don't don't consider women in diversity. But what I do think about in my day work that pays for my lifestyle um, is that when you're talking about bringing people to the table, that the women that you bring to that table not only are in decision-making roles, but that there was a thought process as to who they were as people in the community first. So I'm gonna put that in because we have just a little bit more time with you. I'm gonna switch that into when you become mayor, because we like to speak manifestations on this show. When you become mayor, when you get to the hiring process, what is your plan to make sure that there are black and brown women at the table in decision-making roles that are going to affect the lives of people in this city? The way that I ensure that I do that once I'm elected is that I do it in my work before I'm elected. It has to be part of the, the plan to get there. I don't get elected on November 2nd and start then my transition team and, and start that interview process. That work mm-hmm. needs to start beforehand. That work needs to be part of the leading up to. And I'm very proud that my office at City Hall has been a diverse office, that we've had women of different, in, in, in my office, it has been all women. I think it, it happened initially by accident. Nothing we, wrong with an all girl band. We do, we do have a, <laughs> we do have a, um, I, we've had young men over the, over the years that have worked part-time in my office. But I, I do think that women approach work in a slightly different way. And, and there'll be men on my cabinet. Um, if they're low fragility, (laughs) (laughs) but I do think women approach work in a very different way. Um, I think that it's been one of the keys to my success. And I also think this is sort of a little bit of an aside, but one of the boys walked by and, and reminded me of it. And I had a conversation earlier today, um, with a few women who are in a male dominated field. I came from teaching. It was a female dominated field. Sure, sure. Um, and you know, I think that women, also owe it to the men in their lives. And, and in my case, the, the young men in my, li- in my life, 
that they see role models that are females. Uh, and, you know, I often get for me, oh, too bad you didn't have any daughters, Anissa. I said, well, yeah, I was gonna think you're outnumbered in your house. You're lucky you got I'm like very, a gas very station. Much, you know? like, very much outnumbered. But that means what I can't inspire my boys. Sure. Sure. I should be, they should see inspiration in the women that are around them. And I'm proud yeah. of my strength. I'm proud. I have sisters that are, are very strong, independent women, successful women. I want my boys to see that yeah. because it's, it's really important thing. But again, it's about, you, you build a team um, that can do the work mm -hmm. that is, um, that are, that reflects our city, how important yes. that is that it reflects yes. the city and has shared experiences. My mm -hmm. work around homelessness, my work around substance use disorder, my work around, you know, inadequate access to mental health care. You need those that have had lived experiences to lead on the work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, I'm excited to do it. I, I look forward to doing it. I'm doing it today. I think that it's really important to note as we find answers, um, or partial answers anyway, to some of our city's greatest problems that mm -hmm. we act on them now in the immediate. We don't wait until an election. I'm a city councilor today. Yeah. We talk about something in a meeting that can be resolved next week at city council. I'm gonna do it. That's my commitment. I've been elected. I'm still in my city council seat. I'm still occupying that seat. I'm still representing the residents across the city of Boston. Mm -hmm. I need to stay true to that commitment, yeah. even though I'm also running for mayor. Well, listen, I'm so glad you came on to, to explain uh, why you're running, but also to answer some, some kind of tough questions. We hope to have you back on. Um, we're going to have a lot of people back on as the race ramps up, uh, especially in the summertime. And so are there any last one? Where can people find information about your website? Who do they talk to? Like, get you... Put your tags together, girl. I love it. I love it. Well, it's anisaforboston.com, A-N-N-I-S-S-A-F-O-R-B-O-N.com. <laughs> -S -S uh, but you can find me on most social media platforms using that. I just, you know, and if anyone's interested in helping on the campaign trail, if anyone has um, some ideas around some of the solutions to our most pressing problems, don't wait. I want to hear them now. And if you want to get involved with the campaign, um, we're in the midst of, you know, reforming and reviewing and reimagining some of the, the policy work that we hope to do in, in, the, in the big office. And I look forward to doing it. Fifth, want to do it partnership. I'm a big believer in government is a team sport. It's a hashtag I use on occasion. And that means government officials should be working together, whether it's the mayor and the city council, the state legislature, the, the governor, the federal government, our congressional delegation, but also it's in partnership with community. It's in partnership with each other. We, yeah. um, we need to do this together. It's it, the work is too important to not do together. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you came on. I hope you have another glass of Prosecco. I'm going to already, I'm already refilling. This is this, I'm going to have to turn the ceiling fan on. I'm starting to sweat. It's terrible. So please, please, please make sure you come back, share this video with your audience. Um, you, you really hit on some topics that I think everyone wanted to hear from you. So thank you again, my friend, for coming on. Thank you so much. And thank this my girl, really Nicole wonderful. Caravella, for making it happen. That's my homie. Take care of her. I Nicole, I do every day. She takes yes. care of me, actually. She takes care of me. <laughs> She's good. I'm not taking care of her at all. Okay. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Cheers. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Listen, it's already Friday. Good stuff. It's hate, <laughs> it's not policy. You can have a good time while doing hard work. There you go. Thank you. Bye. See Love you later. You. All right, everybody, you just heard from Anissa herself. And what we are going to do is bring in our next guest, um, Representative Liz Miranda, who is part of our secret special guest for the What You Sipping On um, segment of our show. I want to get up and turn the fan on, but I'm embarrassed because I have on Christmas pajama pants. So I'm not sure I'm going to get up yet. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Liz, where you at? Now, girl, you done texted me. You don't got your photo together. What is happening? Ma'am. <laughs> I need you to get it all the way together. Oh, I'm on live. Yes. <laughs> See, that's why we can't do things. Um, I can't invite people nowhere. It's like an O'Brien night because I didn't know Anissa went to tech. Mm-hmm. So um, Liz and I are both members of the class of 98, um, the best class from O'Brien. Um, we turned out mad leaders. Amazing. 
Right. Um, I was just telling everybody. So I'm on like my third vodka spritzer and I'm hot. Like I'm <laughs> starting to sweat. <laughs> Who drinks white liquor? I, I beg your pardon, ma'am. <laughs> Pass the Cavarcia. No, sir. No one drinks Cavarcia either. But well, I have 1738 here, VSOP, but I don't drink it. So um, I was going to say something. I'm going to keep that to myself. Keep it to yourself. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Um, so, but I'm embarrassed to get up because I have on Christmas pajama pants. So, but I'm just going to get I up. I have fuzzy socks on. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> oh, shoot. Wait. <laughs> I'm drinking water. The favorite drink of politicians. You're drinking water? Why are you wasting my time? Okay. Well, while you're doing Black that. women are not easily forgiven. Ask me if I care. <laughs> So um, I've got my little, got my, I'm going to just go ahead and refill. I, I'm, yeah. I'm revoking your black card because who drinks absolute? Who Ma'am, ma what exactly would you like me to drink? What, what would you like? I'm happy to go to the bar cart. What would uh, you like? Let's see what I got here. Uh, Tito's? <laughs> who drinks Tito's? Hennessy? I have Hennessy. Hold on. Okay. Okay. Sorry, y'all. Uh, I hope everyone's doing well. It's not much. Somebody killed it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's privilege. So yes, I'm listen. thinking the same thing I thought about the 1738. Bye. Goodbye, Liz. You can get off the show now. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. I'm not going to drink this brown liquor on a Friday night. Because then I'll be like, who's having a spades game? It's terrible. All right. So listen, yeah. we just had Anissa on. And she answered some very tough questions. Mm -hmm. And so we brought you on because there's something that happened this week and people are up in arms on social media because they don't understand exactly what happened. And mm -hmm. Stephanie ever just told me, don't mix the liquor. So browns and whites. <laughs> Thank you, That's Stephanie. That's what a leave that. is for. Are you kidding me? Is that what's what it's for? A leave is for? Bye, Liz. What is <laughs> I miss this Liz. No one ever gets to see her. You know, this, you know, I spent 15 years in nightlife and events. I know. I, know that's I miss this Liz. Uh, I know a lot um, about making sure people are okay. Oh, I'll be fine. <laughs> um, so listen, why don't you explain what the transparency bill is? Because what the streets are saying is why did everybody in the black and brown um, caucus vote against being able to have people watch these hearings or participate in them when it's our right to hear what's going on. So explain to these people mm -hmm. what happened, why everyone voted against it, and explain the process too, because I think that's another part that they don't understand. Um, so hi, everybody. Good evening. You know, thank you for bringing up this question. Um, and actually, I think it's a little bit unfair to sort of only look at the Black and Latino caucus because actually a majority of who we consider to be progressive legislators also voted against this amendment. Uh, and so I'll just start from where it began a few months ago. And first, actually, what I need to do is congratulate Erica. She did a phenomenal job. She uh, is the rep who filed amendment number eight. She gave her inaugural speech. And I remember how afraid I was with mine. And she did hers right off the bat. So I need to congratulate her. Um, and the work that they did. So Act on Mass was the organization that had the transparency pledge. Um, they set up a meeting with me um, and I actually agreed to two out of the three recommendations around the committee uh, reports and I believe the 72 hours um, because I believe that government, it should be transparent. And here's the thing, I'm already incredibly transparent with my community. Any vote that I take, uh, good or bad in this process, I'm the first to let my community know. And for the most part, my community doesn't really understand sort of all the nuances that come across because right. my community being the most of color in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. One Say of that the again. Poorest, Say that again. 94% and growing of color. Right. And also one of the poorest census blocks when you think about the Bowdoin Geneva corridor. They're Based really on median big, income, everybody. Based on median Under 24,000. Actually, a majority of my community, at least 50% makes under 17. And we know that in Boston, you need well over 50,000 to even survive. And so I had three people from my community reach out. 
one who was a war chair who really believed a lot in transparency and we had a really good talk um, and two other residents who were black women and I said to them, you know, I really uh, am supportive of these two pieces of uh, this um, transparency pledge. But what happened is that amendments don't exactly sometimes match. Um, the language that was discussed. And so the discussion I had with the organization and my two constituents that night did not match the amendment language. And so in that moment, most legislators are asked uh, to vote on that amendment, you know, to vote on that specific language and they yep. moved the goalposts. I was comfortable with 72 hours, they moved it to a week um, and they added another section. And at that moment, uh, a lot of my colleagues was like, uh, we believe in this concept. And sometimes when you hear things on Twitter, let me just take a moment to say two things and not deflection. You know, disagreement doesn't mean we're not on the same team, right? Mm -hmm. And I believe in a lot of policies that are progressive, but here's the thing. White progressive values and policies and the things that they fight for in many cases is not aligned with what me as a black woman progressive um, have to fight for. And I'll give you an example. Perfectly uh, said. And, you know, I often have to sit not only at this position being a representative of the Fit Suffolk, but because I represent the largest Black district and I'm one of only four Black women, I also think about what I'm saying and doing for the entire Commonwealth, right? There's not enough of us to go around. And I'm just tired, you know, I just, I told Progressive Mass on, I got an award, thank you guys so much, because they know that my policies and my word match up and I wouldn't support something unless I felt strongly and the amendment just didn't speak to me and was not a priority to my district and I vote for my district. I don't vote for things just symbolically to get a pat on the back or get tweets. I'm here to say, if I'm gonna change government, I'm gonna change it one thing at a time. Yeah. And I think that we're moving toward greater transparency, even this session, how we started all this remote technology, this yeah. was not the case that I entered the state house with. But here's the point. I got on their uh, event in January, really thankful. And I said to my progressive brothers and sisters from all these organizations across the Commonwealth, y'all need to go have a time out because, <laughs> you know, I'll drink to that. So give my water. I mean, it's just sad looking at you like drink water. I know. <laughs> I don't want no one to think that I, I didn't uh, pursue this conversation with a lot of thought. And, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this because sometimes people attack you on Twitter and where were those people with police reform? You know, I just went through mm. six months of, you know, not be honest, you know, I could be vulnerable. I was hoping as a freshman legislator, uh, when I sat down to think about writing that use of force section, that someone else would come to save us or save me. I don't know why, but then after a while I said, you know what? I gotta do no knock warrants. You know why? No knock warrants kill more black women and children and elders than any other use of force in this country. Yes, Yet right. it barely passed. It barely passed. You know why? Because some of my progressive colleagues and some of my folks who think that they're liberal and they're Democrats, you know, they don't see the issues plaguing the black community in the same way. And so although transparency is incredible- I'm gonna just correct you. They don't want to see those issues. Yeah. And I think we're in a season, you know, I just have to be real. COVID ain't the only thing we're struggling with. Come on. I'm tired. We're going through multiple pandemics since March of last year. And I can't believe it's been a year. Maybe. I've had thousands of unemployment claims. I think they're tired of me. I'd be like, Mavis, how you doing, Mavis? I need your help, you know? Yes, uh, yes, Jessica, yes. Um, right, right, you know, right. Raft, you're talking about food insecurity. And you know what? The government was slow to react. These were, it was my community organizing expertise and my community that stepped up to the plate way before a policy or a piece of legislation or the executive branch responded. Mm -hmm. And so the reason why I'm saying they need a timeout is that Sometimes they believe coherently in one issue. And that issue is very important to them, whether it's climate change without environmental justice, you know, wind energy, dealing with flooding, um, transparency, for example, which is incredibly important. I'm faced with trying to figure out how to balance that and moving government forward with basic, basic needs. Yeah. One in 20 people in Massachusetts are millionaires, but for the rest of us who aren't, many of whom live in districts like the Fitz Suffolk and places yeah. like Lawrence and Brockton, 
they're looking for legislators to understand that the most vulnerable and marginalized people didn't just get marginalized and vulnerable. And so that's the short and long answer. And I'm still friends. And this is one thing about me. People know, someone just tweeted me the other day about life without parole. And I'd love to talk about that when I get a chance. I what didn't want to die. Now? I didn't want to die on a hill, you know, that could jeopardize my entire agenda, you know, and I am still cool. Like we peoples, you know, we believe in 90% of the same things, but when you are voting for an amendment, let me make it very clear, that amendment language, whatever you were lobbied on, whatever your community has asked you to support. And remember, I told you three people reached out out of the 42,000 people in my community, three sure. people cared. And you know what I did? I listened to those three people. Sure. You know, that's my I job. Get that. I get that. So, that was a long and short. So, so I just want to condense this for the people. Um, so basically, what happens when legislation is brought up, um, it is brought up with a certain language, like, okay, we're going to, you know, install all new Anderson windows. And we're going to do that by March 3rd. And then somebody comes along and decides, I want to throw an amendment in there that says the windows have to be blue. But the people who just want the windows are just like, listen, we just want this package. So what happened is you guys came in with a certain amount of language, a certain language. Someone threw some amendments in there that did not line up with what you had originally asked for. So you had to kill the bill. So, so you voted against it. That's what happened, people. I, I don't want it to make, I don't want to make it seem as if they are not being transparent. The bill had amendments that would have either been detrimental or were not in line with what the original premise was. So, and that's what happens with legislation. And they have little sections in the amendments. And one of the things that I did not, that came out of nowhere for me was there, there was this uh, section, it was in sections that was talking about the bonding committee. And let me just be frank, like I didn't have enough time to vet that piece with my community. Um, I had been told there were three priorities and I was actually super comfortable with two out of three and the third one, I was like, you know, um, we'll work it out when we uh, amend language. Um, and so sometimes when people tweet, they're like, they make it a broad statement. Like, how come you don't want your committee votes to be heard? I mean, that I'm tweeting usually through hearings and posting on Facebook where people can get easy access to information mm -hmm. because I'm not afraid. I'm not playing possum out here. I didn't mm -hmm. come to play anybody uh, with anybody in the legislature. And like I said, there's no smoke on my part. Like you don't always agree with how people take votes, but if you believe in the person's work ethic and demeanor, um, if they lead with integrity, you just can call them and ask them. You know, my community knows, they text me all the time. They'd be like, Liz, can you tell me what you think of this? Or Liz, why didn't you do this? Or why did you do this? Mm -hmm. And a simple text, I'm like, hey, this is why. And it's addressed. And I think that if more people were open to government, you know, I'm like the ops, I know. I'm in politics, right? I get it. But not all of us are the same. Right. Not and all I think of us that's are what's same. important. That I think that's what's important. Um, so let me just switch gears on you a yeah. little bit because we've been talking a little bit about um, identity. It's Black History Month. Um, so what people don't know, if you didn't go to O'Brien, you didn't know that Liz was vice president of the class of 98. Um, <laughs> so it is no, um, it's not surprising to any of us. I know Sonique is watching. Um, any of us hey, girl, hey. that, <laughs> that Liz is an elected official. That's exactly where we thought she'd end up. Really? Um, well, I mean, I feel like I have to say that. <laughs> Be politically correct. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, Liz was actually, um, this is, I'm so embarrassed to say this, but it's so true. Liz is the first Cape Verdean I had ever met. I didn't know what a Cape Verdean was until I got to O'Brien. There was you, there was Nilda, there was um, Jackie Gomes, Jackie, there was all Amanda, these people. Damita. Um, I had no idea what a Cape Verdean was. Um, and, but Liz identified as a black woman, as an African, as a matter of fact. Um, and that's what I loved about O'Brien. It was like, it was like this mixture of like all these different cultures. I was on Clubhouse talking about this last night. Like, you know, I grew up in a group oh, called God, Jack I'm and Jill sorry, and it's all, come on now, get it right. Mm -hmm. um, it was just basically like, you know, you being introduced to other black kids that were of your station and that's who you hung out with. 
Um, that's who you married. That's who you dated. Um, so I didn't know when I got to high school, child, lost my mind. <laughs> like, I lost my mind. Like, Here goes the, so diaspora. the diaspora. I was like, oh, okay, okay. Um, there goes the Trini. There goes the yes. there goes the Jamaica. Girl, yes. lost I, I my you, mind. mind. Um, so Liz was the first person I met that uh, that said I am Cape Verdean and explained what that was. Um, and then she was pointing out like other Cape Verdeans in the cafeteria. But um, so Liz, identity is playing such a big part in, uh, in politics and elected officials. We just had Anissa on, I asked her a very hard question, which is like, how do you identify? Um, and she was very open and honest about the struggle of being biracial and having to pick or choose um, and not placate to an audience. Now, obviously you identify as a black woman. You belong to Delta Sigma Theta, which is an African-American organization, 1913. Go ahead and, and do your thing. Oh, uh, there we go. Um, and so um, how, how do you want people to see you as you show up in the world? And how does that affect how you legislate? You know, it's really important because I went through a lot of these struggles and I'll just share. I grew up in a very Cape Verdean community. So I grew up in a community. My mom was a teen mom. My father wasn't as involved in my life. I'm one of 11 children. And so my most important identity, I think, is a sister and daughter. And that's where I lead from. And it's really important that I didn't realize that in high school because I went through my own struggles. So I grew up on Dudley Street on Woodward Ave and Clifton Street, uh, two notorious streets that basically I was nine years old when an officer told me that I lived in the worst street in Roxbury. I was 14 years old when I was in Orchard Park hanging with my friends and essentially realized that there was a difference between OP and where I lived. Now I lived in a house with like right, 15 or right, 20 right. people. Yep, yep. You know, my mom didn't turn on the heat to like March. <laughs> <laughs> we had to take blankets and you know, our uncles, our grandparents, our come cousins, mm -hmm. everybody yeah. was in the goddamn house, but we had a house. <laughs> and um, I went through this very visceral reaction with culture because my mom has very white skin and blue eyes. My father was very dark. But my mom always, always told me we were black. And she tried to explain it the best way she knew how, that the reason why Cape Verdeans have a varied response to culture and race was really three part. Colonization does a number. If you think about structural racism, mm -hmm. they had nothing on um, what colonization in countries like um, the Dutch and the French um, the Spaniards and the Portuguese. Oh, Mr. Hall would be so proud of you, right? Yeah, you know, um, Mr. Hall would be like, girl, tell the black story, oh. tell the black story. <laughs> and um, colonization, Cape Verde was 10 islands and each island, um, it was a major stop in the, uh, the slave trade. And what people don't realize is the transatlantic slave trade, let me just give you a history lesson, came hundreds of years transporting Africans uh, from Africa to the new world, Brazil, um, Jamaica and the U.S. were the top three in that order. Mm -hmm. Millions of Africans were taken to Brazil and then were taken to Jamaica and also the Caribbean and then before they came to the Americas. But yeah. before that, there was European trade between Africa. And so each island was populated with uh, sailors, with prisoners from different countries, people That's that they right. ostracized. There's That's a right. lot of Jewish culture in Cape Verde. A lot of people don't know that. Oh, I didn't know that. My mom was like, you know, you're going to hear different stories because based on what island people are from, they have a different cultural norm. The second thing is when they came to communities like Roxbury, that at the time in the 70s were, were going through arson for profit, urban renewal, people made it clear that you don't want to be Black right? You know, you're a hardworking immigrant. You, you're going to be good to the community. And so they became this, our grandparents' generation honestly just wanted to work and give their kids a better life. They were very mm -hmm. poor. Mm -hmm. And so they became like this sort of Puerto Rican versus Black American. Right, like right, right. for people. Mm -hmm. And I think Boston has, you know, Boston's history is actually, I think, downplayed the contributions of all these cultures because it's not only the Irish and the Italian that have made Boston, it's the Syrians, it's it's the people from 
I'm glad you said that because that's that's sort of the message that we're trying to get to these people who are running for, for mayor is that there isn't really one Boston. There's a myriad of different Bostons. And, and that's okay to say. Like I'm I'm sort of over these people with the whole one Commonwealth, one Boston idea. Um, you know, I just as somebody, and I, I I make this very clear, as somebody who was born and raised in the city of Boston, went to school in the city of Boston, what came of age in the city of Boston. My parents owned homes in the city of Boston. I am not a transplant. And so I see this city. It's history, it's good, it's bad, very differently from somebody who took a vacation to go somewhere else and then came back to the city. We'll get to that in a minute, y'all. Yeah, we and it's our city. You know, and here's the thing. When I got to high school, I remember I left the Catholic church, which my family was deeply rooted in, because when I was 16, someone at that church who was my friend said to me, why do you always hang with black people? And I said- Because we're them, dope. Cause I looked, but I looked around and was like, what you mean? We are like, a whole mood. We are a I'm black, like, we, are a whole we mood. are black. And they were like, no, that we're different. And I was like, no, yeah. we're not different. You know how I knew we weren't different? I was like, at 16, my brothers had already been incarcerated. You know, mm -hmm. I had already lost people in community. I had already realized that I was working two jobs, going to an exam school, trying to make my way and we were different, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so I think for me, I've always been unapologetically black. And I think that what, what really helped me in my race was when I had to reintroduce myself to the Cape Verdean community. And some people still don't think I'm Cape Verdean enough. But you know who appreciated me? Like, what's the litmus test? Like, what? I, I don't know. Maybe if I speak better Creole, maybe I'm that's what say. it is. <laughs> um, the thing that appreciated my neighbors who lived in different, like, four corners and other places was like, thank you for being a Black woman who can speak other languages, but you're not leaving us behind, too. Okay. Right? This is not an or thing. This is an and thing. And intersectionality, I just want to say this to end that. Um, I have a deep, deep understanding of myself as a black woman. Um, and that only came from going to college and going through high school. I didn't get my first black history class until I was a junior and senior, right? It's a it's a hall. <laughs> and, you know, there was a lot of things I knew, but there was a lot of things I had to unlearn about blackness and womanhood yeah. Yeah. that he prepared me to enter Wellesley really strong. like. You know, I'd like to only see one of me across the yard, maybe yeah. once every month. Sure, um, sure. So I, I, I take no shorts here. I've been mm -hmm. a black woman my entire life from Roxbury, and that's just what I—that's who I am. And well, I love that you said that. The thing is, the sister stuff. Like, I think about my siblings every day. I'm the only legislator that has an incarcerated sibling right now. Mm -hmm. I'm one of two. So I'm that gives black. you a different perspective. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're. I'm one of two black women. And we both lost siblings to gun violence. Yep. And both my dad and my oldest brother were deported. So I understand the Black immigrant experience. So I bring that all to all my legislation because I can't pick and choose. Well, you know, my wish is for you to run for governor one day. So we'll get there. Um, Congress? Because... No, no Congress? Congress, oh, girl. Mm. You don't want me to um, go to D.C.? No, <laughs> Who's going back? <laughs> no. Um, so I am so glad that you took the time to explain that. And I'm also glad that you came on the show. We will give you a spotlight next time. We won't make it a special secret guest. Yes. Um, but I wanted you to come on and explain that because I think it's important, especially when you have a lot of keyboard killers on social media saying, you know, oh, look at this and, you know, making sure that they're sharing it without actually knowing the story behind it. So I want to thank you for yeah. coming on. You're, you know, you're always, you know, your family. Yeah, you always keep it real and funky. And one thing I've appreciated when I decided to run, thank you for being there. Sure. To kind of be a sounding board um, to me. And, you know, it's kind of, I pinch myself to think that I'm in my second term and I did so well my first term and just gave me the confidence to be like, so this term, you guys are going to see a lot more. Unleash the beast. Unleash the Kraken or whatever. <laughs> like, do it. For so sure. thank you all. Next time I'll bring something a little bit more interesting tell than us, water. Tell us where they can find you on Twitter and IG. Yep. 
at rep Liz Miranda um, on Twitter and IG. Liz Miranda, I still use my own personal page and um, you can inbox me. And I just wanna shout out Kevin. I know he's listening, my my fabulous um, legislative aid. Oh, we Kevin, filed 33 Kevin. bills and I couldn't have done it without him. So thank you. Awesome. All right, thank you, Liz. I appreciate it. Appreciate so you too. And do not drink absolute, yo. I'm going to get you a bottle for something good. Back up out my wallet, first of all. <laughs> you know you make real money. $20 absolute. You can drink better than that. Somebody send Jaquetta some real vodka. Cash app. <laughs> I appreciate See you later. That. Thank you for inviting me. Bye-bye. For sure. Thank you. All right, everybody. Before we close out, I want to make a statement about something that I witnessed earlier this week that really has me pissed off. And I wanna direct this to every mayoral candidate in the city of Boston. When you are talking about the city of Boston and you are putting a spin on the city as if we are all poverty stricken, we are all um, in gangs or there's a homelessness or there's an opioid problem, you are absolutely wrong. And I'm about to call you out for it. This city is rich in culture. It has a myriad of different cultures. And every piece of ground that people like myself walk on is earned, but not only is it earned, it's appreciated. So before you decide to run for mayor, you need to think twice about whatever campaign video that you're putting out, walking in the dark, as if the city is this place of like an episode of Unsolved Mysteries. It's not, and you're wrong. And you do not represent this city. You will never represent this city with that kind of attitude. So let me be clear again. If you didn't come of age in this city, you absolutely don't speak for this city. And I don't care what kind of narrative you wanna push. I don't care what kind of identity you wanna push on people. You know, and I know the truth that that is not who you are and that is not what my city is. So before you decide to go further in your pursuit of a mayoral race, you better remember that there are people like Larry Van Zandt, Jackie Anderson, Odessa Boinkins, and everybody else who's worked hard in this city to make a living and for it to be a place that their kids can be proud of. You better think about those people before you put any kind of negative spin or negative adjective on my city. I want to be very clear. So I hope that you guys enjoyed this episode. This is a really good one. And next, we're going to have another special guest next week, but I cannot announce it just yet. Um, but for everybody else who keeps sexing me, I done told y'all. So make sure you tune in tonight at 11 p.m. if you miss me at five on NBC10 because I'm gonna be talking about Stacey Abrams and um, her impact. So again, thank you all for tuning into Politics and Prosecco. I hope you drank as much as I did. <laughs> And I don't care what Liz says, I'm gonna finish this bottle of Absolute before I move out of this place. So Liz can go on about her business about that. Again, thank you all. I hope you tune in again next Friday at 6 p.m. It's going to be a blast. I'll see you guys then. Bye.